So if we take the test on Thursday, that gives us Wednesday, Thursday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. That gives us six more days for testable lab material. Um, there's a significant possibility that I don't want to do a full know that you need to take better notes than before or take better no take notes making in a so we're going to talk about engine operation I believe of all the things about jet engines one of the most fun things there is to do with them as an aircraft mechanic is to fire those puppies the chemical energy to normal yeah, but I'm sitting in a cockpit or standing next to an engine, I'm hearing the noise more than I feel the heat. But hey, whatever floats your boat, Frederick, if, if you like the heat. So we're going to talk about how to start a jet engine and how jet engine starting works. And these are all very important things for aircraft. The first thing we're going to cover is what is the purpose of this starter? Whether it's a pneumatic starter or an electric starter, and I'm not going to get into it, there, are, there is a CH-47 actually has a hydraulic motor that starts the main engines. It's to take the engine from zero RPM to above what's called self-accelerating speed. So the engine is going to be at zero RPM, and we've got to get the engine RPM up high enough that it doesn't need the starter anymore. And that's really kind of what self-accelerating speed is. I think that's the next line. There it is. Self-accelerating speed is the RPM. If you turn off the starter, the engine will keep accelerating to idle RPM. So I'm going to say that self-accelerating speed has a definition. It's the engine RPM. If, if you turn the engine will keep speeding up to the idle RPM. So I'll get let's say you start up the starter gets up to twenty percent, you turn on the ignition, click, 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 turn on the and the engine accelerates. And let's say it gets up to forty percent RPM and then you let go but the RPM yeah. Let go of the starter at or after the self-accelerating speed. For instance, I guess it might do better if I went like this. If we have an RPM gauge, and we'll say 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, and all the way to 100. 20, 40, and 50. Literally, what we're going to do on this engine is at zero RPM, we're going to engage the starter. I don't know why that thing keeps coming on, but we're going to engage the starter. And we're going to end up holding the starter in. And I know this is very generic, but we're going to say that we're going to engage the starter and leave it on until 40%. But we're going to leave the starter on a little bit longer than we think we need to. So literally, right in here, that self-accelerating speed might be about 35%. Now, what's interesting is I've never seen a self-accelerating speed published in a maintenance manual. The thing you're going to see published in a maintenance manual or an operating handbook is it's going to say, when do you let, get to let go of the starter? Somewhere slower than that is where self-accelerating speed is. And it's not published. It's not some exact amount. And it's going to vary based on what's the air temperature that day, what's the air pressure that day. In any case, we're always going to hold the starter down until a little bit after self-accelerating speed. And you're going, well, Mr. Johnson, if I let go of the starter, how is the engine going to accelerate? Anybody want to try a guess? Because ignition and combustion. Yeah, if we start burning fuel, what happens to the velocity of the air going through the turbines? It goes up. Yeah, the speed picks up. Turbines drive the compressor. 
So literally, let's say on this engine at 20% is where we turn on the ignition and we turn on the fuel. So I'm going to use this red line equals uh, fuel burning. And this blue line, this blue line is, that, is the starter. So you'll notice there's an overlap of 20%. That first 20% from 0 to 20%, the only thing that's making the engine spin faster is the starter motor. But we hit 20, we turn the ignition to on, we turn the fuel nozzles on, the fuel squirts in it, they catch on fire. And now for this percentage here, for this from 20 to 40%, we still have the starter engaged, and that's making the engine accelerate. And we also are burning fuel and that makes the engine accelerate. But if we're past the self-accelerating speed, which in this case, we're going to be past it by about five degrees, we let go of the starter, the starter stops. The engine continues to accelerate to, in this case, 50% is idle. And these are the generic numbers we're going to use in this class in this ground, this ground school, in this lecture, to say that a generic engine, it doesn't apply to any exact thing, but if you wanted to say, how does a jet engine start, it's all going to be just like this. The only thing that's going to change is when do you turn on the starter, when do you let go of the starter, what's idle. That's really just the numbers. Instead of idle being 50, idle might be 45, it might be 65. Any questions there? All right, I want to look at this chart. This is a chart that shows time during start. Okay, at this moment right here, you'll notice this is temperature. And I'm not going to ask you to draw this chart on the test, just to be clear. This is for illustrative purposes only. So this is temperature. Temperature starts going up right about the time when we turn on the ignition and we turn on the fuel nozzles, so the fuel nozzles will squirt fuel into the engine. It usually only takes a second or two from the moment the fuel starts coming out of the nozzles till they catch on fire. A second or two. So the RPMs continue to go up. The RPMs continue to go up, and of course the temperature continues to go up. And you'll notice, look how fast the temperature is rising. If we go from right here to right here where the temperature is at, is at its highest, this time right here may only be 5 to 10 seconds. The smaller the engine, the faster it's going to be able to speed up because it doesn't have much inertia trying to slow it down. So if we're talking about a T62, there were four people in here that, that fired up the T62 APU yesterday. How many seconds from when you turned on the starter to when the engine was at full speed. How many seconds? Guess. There were four people that did this yesterday. Two to five seconds, yeah. The inside parts on that engine, do they weigh very much? 
No. Now they got to go up to like 40, 50, 60 thousand RPMs, but they don't have much inertia. Let's go the other way around. Let's talk about a transport category jet, an airliner. Does that engine weigh more than five or ten pounds? The part that rotates? Yeah, it's gonna, it's not going to weigh 500 pounds. It's not going to weigh a thousand pounds. The part that spins might be two or three thousand pounds. You can't get that thing to spin up to I, even to idle in two to five seconds. It might take 20 seconds. But still, it's a very short period of time from the moment you turn on the fuel nozzles to the moment that the EGT, so this is your peak EGT. In the meantime, at some point, in this case, and I know it's hard, don't worry about trying to read back there. This is the one of the few places where I've seen, this is actually the self-accelerating speed. And then just after that, is, I don't like their order, just after that is the starter motor cuts out and then the RPMs still go up before they level off at idle. So this is, I'm just showing you this graph because this is a different way to describe what I described on the previous slide with an RPM gauge. It still happens at zero percent, you turn on the starter and so forth. Okay. All right, I want to talk about what's going on during this starting cycle. So let's see. Can anybody tell me, while the turbine engine is running under normal conditions, what's the only thing that's cooling the inside of the jet engine? Water? Is that what you said? Oil? Yeah, you know what? I, I let me back this up. I think that is correct in that engine oil does cool the engine a ridiculously small amount. Seventy five percent of the air going through the engine core is just there for cooling. So that means percent of the air going through the core of the engine. Does it get burned up with the fuel? No. Okay. So what else is going through the engine core that's there for cooling? Do we have radiator fluid? No. Well, we're burning 25% of there. So how about this thing? I just say, what is the biggest thing? What's what cools a jet engine more than anything else? Yeah, the the air on the outside of the engine blowing around the outside of the engine. Where is this? Where is it? It's the air that's going through the engine. It's the air that's going through the engine core. The air going around the outside of the engine doesn't help very much, not even a half of a percent. It's not like a reciprocating engine where you blow air across the fins, a huge amount of the cooling. It's not like that at all. Okay, so to, while the engine is running, what's pumping air through the center of the engine? What's pushing air to the core? The compressor. Okay, so if the compressor's not spinning, how much air goes through the engine core? Zero. Okay, same thing going on during engine start. There's one thing, or well, let's put it this way, primary greater than everything times 10 that's cooling the engine during start is the compressor blowing cold air through the engine. If you don't have the compressor blowing cold air through the engine, then the inside of the engine is going to get way too hot. So this is a trick question. Don't say the answer out loud. I'm going to say that three times, and then I'm afraid someone won't pay enough attention. Don't say the answer to this following question out loud not until I ask. So if we're starting the engine up, and we turn on the fuel and the ignition, and then we wait five or ten seconds, and then we start to spin the compressor around, what will happen during that five or ten seconds before we spin the compressor? Don't say the answer out loud. Yes. We turn on the fuel and the ignition system. The fuel catches on fire in the bottom of the engine, but we have not started spinning the compressor yet. Wait ten seconds. Let's, we, we wait five seconds. We wait five seconds. Then we start spinning up the compressor with our starter motor. What happened during that five seconds? before we spun the compressor. Don't say the answer out loud. 
So I want you to just let that thing think. You, did you have a question or a statement, Ash, Ash, Ashton? Okay, good. I don't say it out loud. So I want you to think about starting a car. Anybody in here not operated a motor vehicle? Okay. Car, you turn the key to the on position, the lights come on, and the radio starts playing Megadeth because you didn't turn it down the last time you were, you had your MP3 player going on. And you turn it one more little bit of a rotation, and the starter motor spins. At that moment that the starter motor spins on a car, ignition on, and yeah, is fuel going into the engine? In a millisecond, within a tenth of a second, is there fuel going into the engine? Yes. And in fact, usually the way we turn cars off is we rotate the key. Is there a little fuel air mixture left over inside of the engine? So there's already fuel air mixture in there before we even started it. So same with gasoline aircraft engines. When you turn the key, now granted, hopefully there's no fuel air mixture in there because you shut the engine off, pulling that red lever out, pulling the mixture out. But when you turn that key, you've primed it, fuel is going to start going into the cylinders, and the spark plugs are going to fire immediately. In jet engines, if you turn on the, it, well, think about it like this. What if you prime the engine? You operate the uh, the accelerator pump on the on the carburetor, or you run the primer and you squirt fuel into the engine on a reciprocating aircraft engine, and then you rotate and turn the engine to on, and then you wait five seconds and then you push the starter motor. Is anybody is something bad going to happen there? No, in fact, on a lot of engines, that's the way you start them up. But on jet engines, if you turn on the fuel and the ignition and you wait five seconds, and then you spin the compressor. So, Ashton, I know you're chomping at the bit. What's going to happen during that five seconds before you make the compressor spin? You'd have... I vote for answer two. You're going to have combustion, and you're just heating up the inside of the, the, combu the combustion section way hotter than you planned. Yes? Couldn't you also have maybe a split second where it's, it might be too hot or not? I can't tell you that part. Okay. But then the fire will use all the oxygen. That's, you have a good point. At some point, the fire would burn up all the air in there. The problem is, in the meantime, you don't know how hot it's because the exhaust gas temperature probes are a foot or two away outside the turbine section. So now you don't know what happened. Well, they, 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 let's put it this way. If everything is working correctly, the needles do not hit red line. They know they should not peg. No! 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 I'm saying that a lot. There's commonly two red lines. We'll get to that. Two red lines, one for start and one for the rest of the time. But the red line on the EGT, that, that needle needs to not exceed it. Okay. All right. So if your let's put it like this. When you turn on the get fuel and the ignition, or ignition and, and let's say the compressor is now spinning, and then you turn on the ignition. Uh, Frederick said that the fuel burning will blow air past the turbines faster, the turbines will speed up, and that will drive the compressor. If that drives the compressor, what happens to how much air goes through the engine? It's going to increase. Okay. Can we now squirt in more fuel if there's more air? Yeah. So that's either going to be up to the operator, but usually during start, that's up to the fuel control. So the fuel control is going to be waiting. As the RPMs go up, it's going to be squirting in more fuel, but it's making an assumption mechanically that more RPM also means more air. You brought up a really good point, Wyatt. During engine start is the moment where the EGT will be the highest for the entire time you're operating that engine. Based on everything works correctly, you're going to write that down. When is the EGT? At its highest on the turbine engine, 
under normal conditions, it's hottest during start. And that brings up a really good point. What's the worst thing you can do to a turbine engine under nor what's the worst thing you do to a turbine engine under normal conditions? Start it. Period. Starting it normally is the worst thing you can do to it. What? I'm going to say that again. Starting jet engines is the worst thing you can do to it under normal conditions. Okay, throwing a wrench in it is worse, but that's not normal conditions. So under normal conditions, engine starts are the worst thing you can do. Lots of cooling air, but you have to squirt in and fuel to get the thing to to idle again. It'd be better if you just took it to take off power and let it sit there for five minutes. It's designed to do that. At least for five minutes. All right, I'm going to keep going. So, what I, well, the point I wanted to get here is that you, when during start, you want the engine to speed up to idle and get the compressor spinning as fast as you can so it'll blow as much cooling air through the engine as fast as it can so the engine doesn't get as hot as it would. So you really want the start to be as short as possible. So how could you have, what could you have, if you were an engineer and you were going to design this entire system, what would you want so the engine would speed up to idle as fast as possible? A lightweight compressor. Okay, but I've already designed a compressor and a turbine, and there it is. Now... I mean, you're, you're correct. Now, what can I do if I have my most lightweight compressor and turbine? Now, what also, anybody besides Kittrick, what can I do so the engine will speed up during start as fast as possible? Well, you're absolutely going to keep the starter on until you go beyond the self-accelerating speed. But if I'm in the engineer and I'm going to design it before a mechanic gets to it, what am I going to put on this engine? Yes, but I think turbine engines are all going to have really smooth bearings. Chan. You could have different sets of nozzles. That's true, but is that going to speed the engine up or just make sure it doesn't get too hot? Right, but during that first part, is the engine spinning up as fast as it could? So I like your thought process, Jacob. A strong starter. You want to have the most big-ass starter on there that you can. That's B-I-G hyphen A-S-S. The problem is, if you have a big-ass starter on there, now you have to carry it around all the time. So some engineer is going to decide, I want a big enough starter that it will spin the engine up really fast and keep the exhaust gas temperatures low. But I want it small enough so that if it's bolted onto the airplane, it can fly around and it doesn't weigh too much. Quite frankly, that's why big airplanes have pneumatic starters, because pneumatic starters weigh less than electric starters do to put out the same horsepower. Pardon me? Yes. The inside of a pneumatic starter is a pinwheel. I've never seen a jet engine started by string. I have seen a jet engine started by hand. If somebody sends me a, uh, a text or an email, I will find the only, the only, the only en turbine engine start I've ever found that could be done by hand. In any case, so, if you have a long engine start, the EGT will be higher. If your engine start sequence is short, your EGT will be lower. Which do you want to have? A short start or a long start? Short. All right. So there you go. So what do you so what do you want to have here? If if the question was what do you want to have during engine start? You want to have the shortest amount of time and you want to have the lowest exhaust gas temperature. I'm not even going to go through that chart. All right. So the problem with you starting a jet engine where a lot of the steps are manually operated, I'm afraid the APU we have, most of the steps are automatic, is that when you start a car, you're used to turning the key and it goes run, 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 and it starts making noise and you let go. 
And in fact, if the car is working correctly, how many seconds are you actually cranking the starter motor? If the car is working well, it's fuel injected a second or two if it's a well-operated car. Maybe, maybe three or four if it's an older car or it's not running that well. But as soon as the engine starts to make noise, what does your hand do to that key? You let go. You don't turn it back. You just let go. So how many times has somebody who's 26 years old and they've been driving for 10 years, how many times have they started their car and when the engine started making noise, they let go? Five times? Ten times? A hundred times? A thousand times? Five thousand times across ten years? A boatload. If you start your car three times a day across a year, you'll have started your car a thousand times a year. Times ten years is ten thousand times. So, how, so you've been trained that when this engine starts and starts making noise, you just let go. And on some engines, that's exactly the opposite of what you have to do. Because we need the engine to keep running, correction, we need the starter motor to keep spinning, even though the engine has started making noise. So a reciprocating engine, after the engine lights off, after the spark gets the fuel on fire and it starts making noise, we don't usually use that phrase with reciprocating engines, but once the reciprocating engine is running and it's been lit, you let go of the key immediately. In this engine, in a jet engine, if we use our generic numbers, you get to 20%, and your other hand, 20%, you're holding on the starter switch. You reach over, turn the ignition on, and you reach over, and you move the throttle, or you flip a switch, and make the fuel come out of the nozzles. <sighs> catches on fire. Your hand has to hold the starter switch down. So this is completely opposite to what you've been doing for hundreds or thousands of engine starts is you have to not let go of the starter switch. You have to hold it down until the RPM keeps going up, until it goes past its accelerating speed to that whatever that RPM is that the manual says, now you can let go. So we already covered this one. Anybody have any questions about this? What cools an engine during start? The airflow going through the core that's driven by the compressor. And, of course, we already covered this question. What's the worst, and I want to add, what's the worst thing you can do for a turbine engine under normal circumstances? Yeah, it's the start. It's the exhaust gas temperature getting so hot during start. So on the test, I'm going to say under normal circumstances, and everything is done correctly, what's the worst thing that gets done to a jet engine over and over and over again? I won't put the over and over and over again part. You start the thing up. That's worse than running it at takeoff power for a minute or two. So, if we want, as Kittrick suggests, to have a big O honkin, maybe I could say that, big O honkin starter motor, in that it's very powerful, that's what we wish we had. Of course, we're aircraft mechanics. Do we decide what size of a starter motor goes on it? No. All we do is make sure the starter motor is working correctly. But what we do need to understand as aircraft mechanics is during start on jet engines, that starter motor is going to use a lot of power, whether it's a starter generator and it uses electricity. It's going to have big cables going to it, and that starter motor is going to get hot. Or it's a bigger engine and it uses a pneumatic starter. It's also going to use a lot of power. It won't get as hot. It'll get about as hot as whatever the pneumatic air is coming into it. If it's got three or 400 degrees Fahrenheit air going into it, the inside of that pneumatic starter is going to get to three or 400 degrees Fahrenheit. But that pneumatic starter is just a very, very small turbine wheel. It's not a, a whole engine. It's just a little tiny turbine section with an output shaft. So you think they make those turbine blades to handle three or 400 degrees Fahrenheit coming off of an APU or coming off of the bleed air on another engine? Yeah, so a pneumatic starter is going to have blades that can handle these high temperatures. And, of course, they can handle them for how long? Can the blades inside of a pneumatic starter handle those normal but high temperatures? Relatively indefinitely. Pneumatic starters typically don't have a limit on how long you can operate them. All right. The accessory gearbox. If you look on, if you're working on uh, reciprocating engines, those O200s in Mr. Zilke's lab class, the accessory gearbox is on the back of the engine. That's where you bolt the magnetos, 
that's where you would bolt, uh, generally is where you bolt the starter motor. There's some engines, that's where you bolt, uh, reciprocating engines, that's where you bolt, bolt on an alternator or a generator. You can bolt a vacuum pump back there. There's a lot of things you can bolt on there. And they all take power from the engine. They take rotating energy from the engine. They take horsepower to drive something. Well, jet engines also have accessory sections. The problem is they don't usually bolt them onto the back of the engine because it gets in the way of the exhaust. So usually accessory gearboxes are bolted to the side or below. Usually it's below the bottom of the engine. And on that accessory gearbox is where we bolt starter motors. So I'm going to show you a picture of what it might look like. Not a picture. Oh, wait. I think it's on the next slide. Sorry. There. Okay. So there's two commonly used phrases that are talking about the same thing, an accessory gearbox and an accessory section are literally just two names for the same thing. So these are the same thing. So here's a big ol' honkin' turboprop. This is off of a C-130. I'm trying to remember off the top. Is that a T-56? It's made, it was made by Allison, Detroit Diesel Allison. In any case, there's compressor blades, and here's the combustor. You don't have to draw this on the test. There's some combustors. Here's some turbines, and the output shaft goes out here, and this thing right here is a propeller gear reduction. Because the engine may be spinning around at 5,000 or 10,000 RPM. This is a really big one. But the prop out here is probably only spinning around at 1,500 RPMs. So we need one heck of a gear reduction. But this box down here, it has a shaft going into the main shaft of the engine. So when the engine rotates, inside of the gearbox rotates. So we can bolt our starter motor on So the way you get the energy from the starter into the engine is through the accessory gearbox or through the accessory section because it's always connected to the inside of the engine, the accessory gearbox. The accessory gearbox has the engine oil pump. You want the oil pump to spin if the engine is spinning? Yes. So is the gearbox, can you in the cockpit, can you operate a lever and disconnect the gearbox from the engine? No, because you're never going to do that. You're never going to do that. How's it going, Brian? So the question becomes, which shaft in the engine gets spun by the starter? Well, I'm afraid I don't know how much you got taught. So I'm going to go through this really, really fast. If here is a generic turbine engine, and let's say the air is going, and this is a turbojet. You know what? We're never going to draw a turbojet. We'll draw a big old turbo fan. So here's our fan. This shaft going through the engine, if it's a fixed shaft engine, and it just has one RPM gauge, we're going to have an accessory gearbox, and we're going to have power coming out, and then we can bolt things on. So here would be the starter, and here would be the accessory section. So the starter, if we were going to look at how is the power going, the power would be going like this. The starter would give power to the accessory. Oh, why didn't it accept my color? The starter would give power to the accessory gearbox, and then the accessory gearbox would give power to the shaft, and now the shaft would all spin, and so would the fan. All of this stuff would spin. And that's pretty simple. And if you take off the fan and you call it a turbo shaft for a helicopter, okay, fine. The fun becomes when, what if there's two spools? What if here's my uh, inside of my engine? And I have some compressor right here, and then a turbine right here, but I also have compressor here driven by this turbine.
This is not my best drawing ever. Now here's my combustion section, and my gases are going to go through there, and my gases are going to go through there. So this part here is called N1, and then N2 is the entire shaft that includes the first compressor and the last turbine. You all get this before with Mr. Asman? Okay, great. So just to be clear, if you're going to have a accessory gearbox on this engine, it's going to come off of the accessory gearbox is going to be driven by N1. It's going to be driven off of that compressor and turbine and that shaft that's on the inside of the engine. So if you put a starter motor on it, what does the starter, which shaft inside of the engine does the starter motor spin? It spins the N1. Now as you start this up, in fact, you know what? I think I have an even better picture. Yes, better pictures. Ta-da! So here's a pretty decent sized turbo fan. So this compressor and this turbine, that's all one shaft, that's N1. N2 on this engine is the second turbine. It's the front compressor, and of course, it's also, in this engine, it's spinning the fan. And it's hard to see. They don't do a very good job of it. But there is an accessory gearbox on here that is connected to, we'll make it a little bigger, it's connected to N1. The accessory gearbox is driven by N1, and the starter is connected to the accessory gearbox. So when this engine starts, try a different color here. When this engine starts... The first thing that's going to happen is this compressor is going to spin. These turbines are going to spin. Note, for that first 20% RPM, we're not burning any fuel. But the compressor is going to spin. It's going to blow past these turbines. And some of this air is also going to blow past the N2 turbine. So some of that power is going to come over here. And these compressors will start spinning. And so will the fan. If you were standing outside this engine at a safe distance away, Yeah, no. If you were standing outside this engine and it started spinning around for start, you might hear the starter motor spinning, and then a second or two or three or four later, this is a big engine, you're going to see the fan, or if you're looking up the tailpipe, you're going to see the N2 turbine slowly start to spin. It's because even before you turn on the ignition and the fuel nozzles, there'll be enough air blowing through the engine to blow across the N2 turbines, yeah. there'll be enough energy air blowing past the N2 turbines to spin, not just spin the N2 turbines, but spin the fan. And then you'll hear the fuel nozzles, you know, the ignition will be on the fuel nozzles, and now it'll all start speeding up faster. All right, so whichever, if you've got more than one shaft in that engine, it's going to spin the one farther down inside of the engine. And, of course, we already talked about the fact the accessory gearbox is, has the starter on it, but there's a boatload of things you can attach to a starter or an accessory gearbox. And I'm putting these all on here because you as a jet aircraft mechanic need to know where these things would be located. So that accessory gearbox, that accessory section, of course, it's going to have the starter on it. It's going to have the oil pump, the fuel pump, the fuel control. That's typically where the generator is bolted on. If you've got hydraulics, that's where the hydraulic pump is going to be on. And you've got to have something telling the cockpit gauges how fast the engine is spinning. So there's usually an RPM sensor on the gearbox as well. So that's a boatload of stuff. 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Name eight of the seven different things typically bolted onto an accessory gearbox on a turbine engine. And I can draw you, I can draw you stick diagrams, but I don't think that's that much fun. I could draw a self-portrait, but that would be fun. Anybody have any questions about a boat? All these things you could bolt onto chat. Yeah. Yes. This one. Okay. On this engine, N1 is orange. Yeah. Think of it like this. Take a, a I, th I think you're trying to figure out where are these two shafts, right? Okay. One of the shafts is hollow. It's like a uh, paper towel cardboard tube. Okay. So that's a shaft, and you can glue, you could glue blades on the front and on the back of it, right? Then inside of that tube is another shaft with bearings supporting it so the shafts don't hit each other. And, but the inside shaft sticks out farther. So literally, this is a tube. And I put compressor blades on the front, and I put some turbine blades on the back. And so this thing right here, and everything attached to it is N1. I can also have a shaft that goes inside of it and put more compressor blades and if I want to, I can even put a fan on it, and I can have some turbine blades back here. And that and N2 is the turbine, the second set of turbines and everything that it drives. So that's the way I think about it, is the N1, the shaft, is a hollow shaft, and the N2 shaft is on the inside of it. Does that, does that do the trick? When we come back tomorrow, I'm going to tell you uh, eight questions that are going to be on the test late next week. Verbatim, exactly. I'm going to tell you the exact question and the exact answers. I will see you, some of you in lab.